All right. Hey, Mike, how's it going? Good, Dan. One of the things I like is we're always punctual for the live stream. We are. Even even <laughs> when the guest isn't here, I've been punctual as well, I think. And it's it's nice. It's actually I feel like it's kind of fun too if you're uh if you start it and then like someone joins. You know, it's like, oh yeah, look, they showed up. And also I feel like uh we haven't I guess we haven't really had this happen, but maybe we should just put the link into general the StreamYard join link into general uh channel and just see if anyone decides that they want to <laughs> jump in and chat want to pop in yeah. yeah well i mean it would be nice to have more people here to congratulate you on your promotion <laughs> well thank you <laughs> do you want to do you want to say what your new title is sure i'll say since since you uh teed me up for it uh <laughs> i was promoted to the head of engineering today so um yeah <laughs> i am super thankful for all the work that you do in like looking down the road and helping figure out what's coming up and what we should be working on and so this feels like a really good move for the company and congratulations dan awesome well thank you mike uh, i definitely re really appreciate that and as i said earlier uh i feel very fortunate to work with such a great team and i'm excited to continue to work with awesome folks like yourself so um yeah, it's been a, a fun year so far, and uh, uh, I'm excited for for what's on the horizon here. So lots of fun stuff ahead. Um, for the uh, for today's stream, we are going to have one more guest, yes. likely. Uh, well, we hope so. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're gonna. I I named the so I've been um our uh, Ariana, who you all met on the stream last week, our head of marketing. Um, uh pinged me a few weeks ago and was like hey maybe we should name the friday afternoon streams what they're about so people know and i was like hmm you know that's a good idea um <laughs> instead of just calling it friday <laughs> afternoon stream um yeah. and i think maybe the rationale initially why we were doing that uh was that we kind of came in and just were like we'll see what happens so we didn't know what to name it um but now we're you know we're growing as a company and we're planning our Friday afternoon stream, uh, <laughs> very loosely planning. But um, so I titled it today. Let's talk about Bluetooth because you've got a demo that involves Bluetooth, of course. Um, and then hopefully Sam is going to stop by um, in a bit as well. And he's been working on some kind of like protocol level work internally. Um, and, you know, I don't have uh, as much experience with Bluetooth, I think, as either one of y'all. Um, and so I'm kind of here to uh just ask questions and and kind of like get y'all to teach me a little bit more um so i can be more informed and, and hopefully uh folks listening can uh, either chime into the conversation or also uh, learn quite a bit but do you want to start us off by maybe like talking about this demo which came out of hack day um and just yeah. giving us sort of an overview of how it works yeah so sam has a ton of experience working um in industry with bluetooth i have done some bluetooth that's like the extent of my embedded stuff with bluetooth so i took this hack day that came up to kind of like dive into um, bluetooth and like zephyr how zephyr handles bluetooth and try to figure it out and so um i think chris was on last week i didn't watch because it was the last day of spring break and i took it off to go family bowling which is a fun time mid-afternoon <laughs> um i bowled over 100 which is great oh, for right. me uh, <laughs> that's in my opinion that's great for anyone so isn't 300 the max score it is and okay, yeah. back before children and actually before marriage uh we used to go out after rehearsals on monday nights with the orchestra and i at that point i was getting good and i bowled a 205 as my high score oh my gosh. which i thought was amazing but yeah. at any rate so I, I don't know what chris talked about last week but um he pulled me in and said let's do um kind of like a bluetooth gateway and I said, the interesting thing to me would be a Bluetooth gateway that can kind of read from on multiple uh, sensors, multiple types of sensors. And so I um, kind of started off with some of the samples that are in Zephyr. There's a health temperature service sample. It's like central HT and peripheral HT. If you're looking in the samples folder, Bluetooth samples, Bluetooth folder of Zephyr, um, and then kind of went off to the races with that. So um, in my, I wonder if we can, move this up here in my experiments i'm using um so this is an era 52840 dk so the 52 is a bluetooth known as a bluetooth 
uh, microcontroller. And then this one is an NRF 9160DK. So it has a um, cellular modem, the 9160, but then it also has a 52 on it. So uh, there is a firmware you can put on this 52 that makes it a UART Bluetooth radio, I guess, for the actual cellular controller. Um, and so that's how we have it set up. It's talking over UART to um, Bluetooth. And then uh, this device is listening for, right now it knows about two different types of peripherals. And those are, think of them as sensors. The term is peripheral. The gateway itself is the central. Um, so the central is listening for two different types of peripherals. One of them is a weather um, type. And so this uh, BME 280 um, weather sensor, uh, sorry, it's not a weather type. It's a environmental sensor service, which is in the spec. Um, and this environmental sensor service has characteristics that it advertises, which are temperature, pressure, humidity. And if we switch over to our uh, Goliath console here, which I'll make bigger so everyone can see, um, but we actually do see coming into real time, there should be readings coming in every 10 seconds from this. Um, and those readings are set by this sensor delay loop right here. But it's not just this weather sensor, which since it's real time, that data's got to actually play before it comes back. Um, I have this third board here, which is again, just an NRF 52. And this is set up as a um, custom device. So it's a Goliath power device. And then it uses the char standard characteristics of um, electrical current, or current uh, power, so like watts and then volts. So when I plug this in, um, it should start advertising and we should pretty much immediately see here's the first reading right here came in. Um, so we have power um, is this uh, property right here and weather. So, you know, these are two different types of sensors that have been seen. And it uh, it actually is spoofing data because Chris is the one that has the actual um, INA219 sensor that's connected to this, but it is all wired up um, for those actual sensors. Nice. And so is, what is the, uh, like, what is the difference or the, uh, complexity with talking to like the different sensors, right? Does, does the interface in your firmware look fairly similar or is, I know Zephyr probably helps, you know, paper over quite a bit of that, but at a kind of like protocol level, are, are there differences? Yeah, so it's actually pretty easy um, to change the sensors that are being read uh, to um, in in with Zephyr because it uses these standard like sensor sample fetch um, commands in order to then um, get the channels out that you want. So here's our voltage, current, and power channels. The thing that's not particularly easy is formatting them to send to um, the over the Bluetooth channel in a spec compliant way. So mm. I actually have another um, visual tool. Give me just a moment to pull it up here. Um, so what you can do is get this document here called the GAT specification supplement. And if I give it just a minute here, oh no, where's, why can't I scroll down? That's weird. Um, they talk about all your data types here and then you start having like all of these characteristics. So here's, uh, this is so weird that I can't scroll continuously on this. I wonder if I can open this in a browser. Well, anyway, um, this has all of the information on it that you need in to, in, to actually be standards compliant on any of these things. So they'll tell you like, um, what the different bits in that are packed in means and, uh, you know, how here's like a date time. There is, let's see if I can grab one out of here, like, I don't know, temperature, <laughs> uh, temperature right here. All right. So if we look at temperature on this, it tells you that you have a signed integer, uh, that is 16 bits wide. So two octets. And then it tells you, uh, that it is, um, 10 to the minus two power to decode that. So in, in order to encode it, basically you shift everything over to decimal places so that um, like the, these decimal points would become 2000 or sorry, 27,315 in the integer. And as long as you know how to do this and you get it all set up in your firmware in order to do those shifts. So you can see like in this case, voltage has a um, uh, like a power of two rather than a power of 10 that you have to deal with. And then I'm also dealing with 
the offset for the decimals of the way that the sensor um, abstraction works on Zephyr. Once you get all this stuff working right on both ends, the sensor, the central and the peripheral, then um, everything just kind of works. Gotcha. And Sam has has just joined us, and this is probably an, an opportune time. Uh, what I was going to ask about here, um, so in the documentation you were just showing there, there's all these different characteristics that you were talking about. And, you know, coming coming from uh, more of kind of like a, a web-based background, right, um, comparing and contrasting Bluetooth with like, uh, you know, sending data over HTTP or something like that, um, you know, it, it's, it feels weird maybe uh, it, for me and maybe for others that there's like all of these different things defined, right? Like, why do we need to define temperature? Why can't you just define your temperature that is like, why can't you just put it in a JSON payload or whatever, right? And the, the reason, right, is it, is it because of interoperability? Because like you have all of these different types of things that need to be able to talk to each other. And so like, uh, if you want generally something that can like, get temperature data or understand what type of data is coming off a Bluetooth device, um, you it's already predefined, right? Just like if you had shared, you know, like a, a proto buff with each other ahead of yeah. time, but it's in the specification. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and because I used the standard environmental sensor service for the, the temperature, pressure, humidity one, any ESS device that's advertising that has temperature, pressure, and humidity is readable by this central device, by our gateway because it's standards compliant. But there are also uh, ways to do it custom that um, I actually use for the power uh, module. Gotcha. So the thing is, well, first of all, thanks for having me back on the show. You know, <laughs> always a great time talking with you folks. Um, we've got the Taika Waititi conversation will happen later in the show, folks, so stick around. <laughs> or maybe one of our other favorite directors. You'll never know unless right. you listen. <laughs> yeah, Sam, Sam's experienced at this, you can tell. Uh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, so interoperability is absolutely the reason. And um, I think like the best way to think about that is like Bluetooth headphones, right? Like you can connect any Bluetooth headphone or, or Bluetooth speaker, right? To like any um, Bluetooth phone or, or laptop. And that's why. Um, I will say though that like, it's mostly for those like consumer use cases where the standards are important, there are a lot of standard profiles in the Bluetooth spec that are not really widely used. Um, and so I think the environmental like sensing uh, service is a great example of one, right? Like you're not usually buying like a weather station from one brand and then a temperature sensor from another brand. Usually that's like part of a kit or they want to lock you into mm -hmm. your own thing. Um, and so a lot of things that are a lot of a lot of Bluetooth devices use custom characteristics, and a lot of the interoperable characteristics are not um, used. Like for example, uh, Fitbits don't advertise; they don't use any of the uh, the health uh, tracking characteristics because Fitbits only sync with their own app and into their own website, right? So there is a standard that exists, but also um, and at, same thing with Apple Watch, right? So there's a standard that exists, but the most popular products don't use it because they're not looking to be interoperable. Gotcha. And what, so it, in that initial discovery, I guess this is maybe like stepping back, maybe, maybe too many steps, but um, uh, in that initial kind of like discovery phase, right? Um, so so you're saying that uh, like, I'll say peripheral and central, what, what are the correct terms in, in that case? Is that's that right? right? Okay. Yeah, that's so right. Um, I think I subconsciously was pulling that from Bluetooth study. I've done the best, maybe. But um, uh, so if you have a, a peripheral and a central, the peripheral peripheral is advertising, right? And the central uh, observes that or receives that. And what what is contained in that advertisement? And then after like uh, you decide you want to connect, what does that pairing process consist of? Or does it differ between different types of devices? So... I would need to refresh my memory to remember everything, but basically uh, the advertisement can hold a few different things and it can hold, the main thing is like your name and your like Bluetooth address, um, but it can also hold um, some information, some custom information, which is, you know, something that um, a lot of companies leverage as well. Um, there is a, there are one of the standard GAT, um, so I think that's another thing we should talk about, right? Where 
where you think the whole characteristic thing is uh, part of GAP, which is one profile in Bluetooth. Um, Bluetooth audio, for example, it doesn't use characteristics or GAT. It's not, it's a different profile. So there are lots of different like levels of standards within Bluetooth. Hmm. Within the GAT profile, one of the GAT characteristics is like a description characteristic that will then list all the other services and characteristics. Okay. So based off of whatever's in the advertising information, you would, you know, determine if you want to connect to that device. Once you do, then you read from another characteristic that uh, is kind of like a table of contents or a directory, basically. Gotcha. Yeah, and so like so, the implementation here in Zephyr, this peripheral device is advertising that it's a Goliath power device, which is a custom UUID. And then it also advertises that it has a BAS, which is battery something service, which is like, if you connect your earbuds to your phone, usually your phone to tell you what percentage of battery life is left on your earbuds, that's the bass. And then, uh, so those are being advertised as the services and then each service has characteristics. And so the characteristic characteristics are set up here. So you can see, um, we again tell it it's the Goliath power service. And then under the power service, I've added these characteristics. So this is a voltage, GAT voltage, GAT electrical current and GAT power. Um, on this, but there's a ton of other stuff that can go under here. And the, again, the samples Bluetooth folder of Zephyr is a good place to look. And so, um, uh, GAT you referred to as a, a profile, right? That's what the, uh, it's profile and then it has services with characteristics. Do I have that hierarchy, right? GAT is a profile. GAT has services. Services have characteristics. I'm going to take your word for it. I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, Sorry, can you say it again? I got distracted. Yeah, yeah. the profile. Profiles have services, service characteristics. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, cool. And so uh, do other uh, profiles have services and characteristics, or they just have their own different hierarchy that, that yeah, they have their we don't talk about? Yeah. Okay, cool. So services and characteristics are part of GAT. GAT is the generic attribute profile, generic at attribute. Mm -hmm. um, there's also GAP, which is the generic access profile maybe okay anyway so those two are usually used together gap is more of like the basic uh like bluetooth identification pairing connection kind of stuff i think um but if you were using like the audio profile uh yeah just services and characteristics i'm i am not super familiar with the audio profile so i don't know what their terminology is maybe mm -hmm. they do use service characteristics but they would be using it in a different context and to mean a different thing Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, and so if you like, let's say uh, I'm a peripheral and I want to allow some devices to connect to me, but others to not, how do we do any sort of like access control or anything like that? Uh, it is difficult. So <laughs> I've seen in my time uh, many um, schemes uh, to do this, all of which I would say are not airtight uh you know I was, when you said schemes i was thinking in my mind like not like schemes like from a technical perspective but like schemes like you know like you're up to something kind of yeah <laughs> maybe maybe um, both in this case <laughs> right so uh the there are a couple of things um so uh i believe this is part of gap the generic access profile but you can um pair you can connect and you can pair right with a, a device um so i'm sure everyone has had the experience of like you're pairing something to your your phone to your car let's say right and the car like displays a code and you have to type the code into your phone um or whatever right so uh this is pairing uh which so there's like so many things in bluetooth so i apologize <laughs> if i like getting any of these details wrong this if is you like have pairing. to pull out the x draw, just do it sam you don't even yeah, have yeah. To just do it. <laughs> this is pairing which um uh, involves the exchange of temporary keys uh, to secure a connection, right? Um, so it is okay, and then and then there's bonding. Bonding is when you take the temporary keys and you create permanent keys, so that the next time you connect to the device, you don't need to pair again. Hmm. Um, so if in that pairing process, if that pairing process requires a passcode or some sort of, you know, uh, authentication 
uh, that can fail and you can do access control that way. Mm. Um, a lot of devices uh, use the just works version of pairing, which is where you don't exchange uh, any codes, right? So in that case, um, you would need to implement your own um, uh, uh, access control and, you know, basically at the application layer through the attributes. Um, but, and, and then what you can do basically to, if you want to deny access is either the central or the peripheral um, can disconnect. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah. So the, the problem or the, the difficulty that a lot of people are trying to solve for um, is most devices, especially most like MCU based peripherals um, can only support one connection at a time, maybe two connections. Okay. So if, it's really easy to do a denial of service on a Bluetooth device just by connecting to it and sitting on the connection. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is where, uh, especially in that like just works pairing mode, um, having some way of booting off, you know, essential that's just trying to prevent you from advertising or, or connecting to other devices uh, can be helpful. And what is like, may maybe this is too much detail or may maybe out of your, your wheelhouse, but what are the, how does that mechanism work to, like boot off the other one? Is it just you issue like an immediate disconnect or something like that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool, cool. That makes sense. And so if you, uh, uh, like there's the uh, authentication process, right? And then there's the like encryption of data that's in transit between the two. So I imagine that even in the just works case, um, you may not be authenticating the central that you're pairing with but you still do like once you have your negotiation you still do encrypt traffic so that other people snooping on it are not able to observe it is that right or is there just a lot of like unencrypted bluetooth traffic flowing around everywhere uh it's generally encrypted with the caveat that that encryption is very easy to break especially <laughs> in the just works case and especially if you're eavesdropping uh on the pairing um it's not generally like a secure handshake and it's pretty easy to extract the I think they call it the SK. I don't know if that's like session key or something key. Anyway, whatever the like secret material is that you need to then derive the the keys that are used for encryption. It's um yeah, it's I would say maybe it's not trivial, but anybody who like, you know, has the the means and the desire to sleep on your Bluetooth traffic uh, can. I see terrifying um i think plug I, your bluetooth keyboard in before you type your password plug yeah. it in usb <laughs> uh i think that we i'm pretty sure at one time i was interrogating you sam about um airpods and i think that they're using like some other thing right not not maybe maybe this is I, we don't have to go into depth here but is there uh how does like how does something like that that I believe has improved security over like your perhaps your general Bluetooth earbuds? Uh, how does something like that kind of like reinforce security in this seemingly rather insecure protocol? <laughs> yeah. So the caveat that I never worked on AirPods and I don't know the details, there are a couple of things about them they do differently. Um, so uh, I believe when AirPods came out, audio. Bluetooth audio was only over Bluetooth Classic, which takes more power than Bluetooth Low Energy. That's why they call it Low Energy. Um, and also, uh, the only Bluetooth audio profile um, was a lossy, uh, used lossy compression. And it was very lossy, and it sounded bad. Um, well, it didn't sound that bad. But if you went on like you know any audiophile uh, forum circa 2015, it was full of people shitting on Bluetooth headphones. Sorry, I don't know if I can say that on the stream. You uh, are. <laughs> okay. Uh, and um, so uh, Apple, I don't know if what they did was an extension of Bluetooth or a different radio technology underneath it. Um, but uh, Apple implemented their own chips with its own with their own protocol that did um, lower power and. I don't know if it's lossless or just a much better compression algorithm, but better uh, audio uh, compression. So it sounds better um, and it used less power, which is why, especially with the first Air AirPods first came out, you know, no nobody had ever seen anything that small um, with that kind of like uh, audio quality and battery life. Um, 
the Bluetooth Sandy has responded, so there is like blue BLE audio now, which has better uh, uh, audio quality. Um, and then, so that's that's part of it. I think Apple still uses their own thing, but again, I'm I'm not like tearing down every AirPod. I don't know for sure. Um, the the other thing you asked was about security, right? So if if you know if I'm asserting that Bluetooth security is um, like completely broken and there's it's there's no going back, what do you do, right? Um, you you encrypt the data at, at the application layer, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the device and your peripheral and central above the Bluetooth layer um, can uh, establish a secure communication channel. Um, you know, using whatever scheme is out there, a pre-shared key, doing some kind of handshake. Um, it's essentially, yeah, like you just assume that you have an unsecured channel, an insecure channel, mm -hmm. and then the standard sort of security um, uh, approaches for, you know, securing communications over an unsecured channel. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, Mike, kind of getting back to uh, your demo a little bit, um, what is the Zephyr Bluetooth support like? Are the, is there any uh, kind of like intricacies in utilizing it or is it pretty you know, easy to do straight out of the box. Was this was this your first time using Bluetooth with Zephyr or had you done it in the past? Um, I'd done one customer demo a few months back that was okay. really just running the Bluetooth samples and they worked, which is nice. Like <laughs> a big win when the samples just worked the first time. Um, it took a little while to get my head wrapped around it, mostly because I was also dealing with the intricacies of the Bluetooth spec, but it seems to be pretty mature. Like they have a ton of stuff that is already defined. Um, I started to run into some uh, friction when I switched to custom UUIDs because they use 128-bit numbers, where the, the spec-compliant UUIDs use 16-bit numbers. And that's because there's like 128-bit UUID that is the base UUID for the spec. And then they just pull 16 bits out of that base to denote all the different, you know, voltage, power, you know, mm. heart rate, uh, all the different stuff that's, that's in the spec. Um, so I don't know, there's still some weird stuff with that. Like uh, if you want to use the function for making your number little endian in order to put it into the Bluetooth packet and then unpack it again, there's no little endian 128. So I scratched my head on that for a little bit and then I went, okay, I could just use the 32, little endian 32 several times and it'll be fine. Um, but otherwise I think, I think easy to get into. Nice. That's awesome. Sam, I know you've been thinking about and, and, working on um, kind of sending data over over Bluetooth that's originally or eventually destined to travel over some sort of IP network. Um, you know, uh, I've, you know, just from kind of like interacting with you and also reading some of your um, uh, research and that sort of thing, uh, I've become aware of a few different models for how you could do that. You know, one is like you I'll say embrace Bluetooth, right? And you use Bluetooth and then at kind of like the central or gateway, uh, you package that up to go over um, an IP protocol. Um, another one is you try to actually do the whatever higher level protocol that you're doing over IP over Bluetooth instead. Um, I think there's probably some some other options or, or you know, uh, it's a kind of a spectrum between those. Um, can you talk about some of the challenges of taking those different strategies and maybe how you've seen different ones used in the past? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think when we were investigating this, um, there were, I guess there are three approaches that we have sort of gone down at various lengths. Well, the first one is, is what Mike's doing, right? Which is where um, you are, it, you're really managing the, the gateway, right? And the gateway is collecting data and sending it up, right? So you can get the data off of there and, and it's really almost like two steps. Like the Bluetooth device doesn't know anything about Goliath or, or the internet. And Goliath doesn't know anything about those Bluetooth devices. It just knows about the gateway. Um, and that's nice because uh, that works today. Um, some of the disadvantages of that, right, is that we, is that Goliath doesn't know about uh, those devices, so um, we don't, we can't manage them individually. We can't. Uh, well, it's it's a lot more. Yeah, we can't manage them individually, right? They show they don't show up as individual devices in our console, um, and it's a lot of more work for the um, application developer for for our customer. At least more work than we're imagining will be for some of this other stuff. 
Um, and what, what Sam is talking about there is I have two Bluetooth devices here. You see the, the Mac address numbers, but they're actually coming in under this single gateway device. So right. all of the sensors that are being read, the, it's just kind of like a data value um, that's being read in that differentiates the peripherals on the Goliath end. It would be nicer to have um, a list of all the devices you were seeing in here. Yeah, yeah. especially if we get into things like, um, so this works <clears throat> well for like data coming off the devices, but if we got into things like firmware updates or uh, settings or RPCs, right? Like how do you target that to an individual device instead of all the devices on the gateway and things like that can get um, a little more difficult. Um, so that's one way. Uh, another approach that we've looked at is um, extending IP over um, wireless technologies or wired over networks that don't usually support it. Um, so uh, for example, Bluetooth has the internet profile, internet protocol support profile, so the profile, um, which uh, uses uh, six low pan to basically create an IPv6 network over Bluetooth. Um, that's great. That means that every all those end devices that are Bluetooth connected have an IP address, which means that, and are connected to the internet, which means that they can talk to Goliath. Um, the issue with that is that uh, IPSP is not um, well supported in um, anything, actually. <laughs> uh, so like whatever your computer on right now doesn't support it. Um, if you are, your and your iPhone and your Android phone definitely doesn't support it. Um, for the iPhone and Android, especially you're limited generally to only the only thing you can customize about Bluetooth is generally uh, in the gap profile, creating uh, new services and characteristics. IPSP is not part of GAT, it's its own profile. So there's no way for you to like implement that at the uh, at the application or like in your mobile app. Um, there are projects that extend uh, IP using GAT. Um, and I, I know for a fact that these have at some point been live in product. I don't know if they are still live and used, um, but uh, the products or, or the those projects are um, uh, they are not very well documented um, and they can be a little bit difficult and complex to use. Um, there can also definitely be some performance uh, implications of, of using something like that. Um, you know, you need a full uh, IP stack. Sometimes you need uh, two of them because like you can't, maybe not able to leverage like in your mobile app, you may not be able to leverage like the native IP stack in order to use it in this way. Mm -hmm. um, so there are issues there. Uh, and then the other potential problem with that is, um, that uh, the sort of semantics of using like, uh, you know, the protocols that we typically use over IP, like um, HTTP or co-op or even like DTLS um, may not lend themselves to uh, certain kind of networks of situations. Like they work really well for uh, where your peripheral is often and for extended periods of time in range and connected to your central. Hmm. Um, so this works really well for like a one-to-one -one or, or a one-to-few uh, situation. Um, but uh, for example, like most Bluetooth centrals can only support maybe eight or 10 peripherals at a time. So if you are in a factory and you are to connect, you know, one Bluetooth gateway to a hundred devices, your uh, central is going to have to be constantly switching between them, you know, connecting to one, disconnecting, connecting to another, um, which, uh, you know, without a whole bunch of uh, chicanery means that you're going to be like constantly redoing DTLS handshakes, you know, the yeah. device is not going to be consistently connected to the internet, um, which, uh, you know, can, can create problems. Um, so, there are situations where we think that is a good option. Uh, if you're in like full control of the hardware, if you are uh, a one to few, if you are generally um, uh, always like statically, you know, like like physically and not moving uh, and connected, that right. works well. Um, 
The third option, uh, and this is where we have landed for some of our more recent efforts, is um, basically using the gateway to just sort of grab data off of the device and upload it in a big opaque binary packet to the cloud and having uh, the gateway also then retrieve big opaque binary packets from the cloud and send them down to the device. Um, this basically establishes communication, secure communication between the device and uh, the backend, right? So we talked about Bluetooth isn't secure this way. Um, it's all secured between the device and the cloud. Um, the gateway is basically just responsible for moving data between back and forth between devices and the cloud. It doesn't really know anything about that data. Mm -hmm. um, what's nice about that is that like that does work pretty well for both cloud and Bluetooth semantics. Um, and it also removes uh, a lot of intelligence from the gateway, which makes it easier to like maintain and update. Like when you want to release a new feature or add a new data payload, uh, you don't need to make changes to the gateway. You only need to make changes to um, the device, the firmware, and uh, and your cloud backend. Um, that's really helpful, for example, if your gateway is like a cell phone, which is being used by an end user who may uncheck the auto update app button. <laughs> Right. Right. Like sometimes if you're if you're not in full control of the gateway, that can be a real problem. And having to like constantly be supporting old versions uh, of, of that intermediary can be a real pain. That's actually one of the places that I explored uh, as part of this hackathon that we did is I made a gateway that just takes whatever is sent by the device and uploads it as uh, either JSON or CBOR to the cloud. So the device can uh, uh, format all the data that it has in a way that Goliath recognizes and the gateway doesn't need to know anything about the device. It just, um, other than it's advertising the service that has this, I called it arbitrary data and can upload it to. Um, but Sam, you're talking about like a lot more than that. You're talking about like a whole subsystem that, um, and a specification on what that arbitrary data should be and how it's processed on both ends, right? Yes, kind of. Um, yes. So it's, it's essentially like another, application protocol, kind of like how HTTP or co-op kind of specifies like how you interact with different endpoints. Um, we're not calling them endpoints, but that's maybe not a bad way to think about it, right? But then there's still like your own uh, actual payload data and how that's formatted inside of that, um, which is, you know, could be like another specification. So what we're talking about is sort of that, at that layer where we're encapsulating data, we're providing a way to like identify what that data is so that when it gets to the cloud or the device, then um, it has enough information to route that to whichever service actually knows how to interpret the, the payload. And it also handle, like we mentioned before, like encryption and authentication and things like that. Cool. Well, that was a great rundown. I feel like we should, we need to take this video and like clip it to like the, these are the ways that you can talk to the internet from Bluetooth devices. Um, the, uh, one question I did have for y'all as, you know, folks who both have some experience with Bluetooth, what is the, uh, most unconventional thing that you have ever seen done with Bluetooth? Well, uh, at the time I first saw it, it was unconventional. Uh, I first saw people trying to do, uh, IP over BOE in, I want to say like 2016 or 2017. And my first reaction was that will not work. That's <laughs> dumb. That's crazy. Um, I was wrong. I mean, it works. Like I've, I've seen it work. I, it's like I said, it may not always be the best choice for your particular application, but the technology is absolutely feasible, mm. um, which blew my mind. And I think it would also blow the mind of like whoever was originally involved in like the Bluetooth spec, you know, they're like, yeah, like we need a way to like wirelessly connect keyboards. Like that's, that's really what we're trying to solve here. Right and now they're like, oh wow, my keyboard can connect to the internet. That's yeah. wild. My keyboard is a web server now. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. How about you, Mike? Well, I actually saw something that's in the standard that allows uh, beacons to be advertised, like not advertising in the Bluetooth sense. I mean, yes, advertising in the Bluetooth sense, but like 
for the purpose of like push advertisements to your phone. And like, this is actually out there and your phone will pick up on these. And I guess just like scammy people haven't figured out yet that they could be putting Bluetooth devices in public places and getting like notifications on people's phones if they have the Bluetooth on. Interesting. Wait, so is is the delivering advertisements the thing that's in the spec or are they leveraging something in the spec to deliver that i I think it's i think it's supposed to be like uh maybe like a public service so you go somewhere Uh, and there's information that everyone needs to know and the bluetooth can beacon that out but i just looked at it i'm like man this is this is uh spam this is bluetooth spam waiting to happen yeah Yeah. i I think a lot of it was for retailers like i think Uh i don't know which one so i'm gonna not name any uh, but imagine you're a very large retail stores and as I, and I think you've seen it more recently than I have Mike, but it, I think the idea was that it would also be paired with, um, indoor, uh, locationing, uh, through beacons. Um, so if you're in the lawnmower aisle, you might get a targeted ad for lawnmowers and things like that. Interesting. <laughs> Drink more Ovaltine. Right. <laughs> Oh, okay, so uh, uh, Timon says it's part of the spec, uh, like local info display. Local Popular info for, display. oh, like museums and stuff. Okay, cool. Mm, that's interesting. That, that's much less uh, nefarious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, uh, what are y'all up to this weekend? Uh, so I am moving at the end of this month. So this weekend I have to figure out all of that i haven't actually planned any of my move or like i'm doing a bunch of traveling in the middle of the month so i need to like actually like schedule things like schedule myself for which things i pack up when so not a super fun weekend but uh on sunday i am gonna drive upstate in preparation uh for the eclipse on monday i am playing uh harry potter and the which one is it? The Half Blood Prince, I think. Uh, they do this thing where they play the movie with uh, with all the sound effects and talking, but none of the music. And then the orchestra underneath the movie screen plays the music. So I'm gonna play two shows of that tomorrow. That's kind of fun. Oh, and then uh, let's see, Monday we're gonna get ninety percent of the eclipse. So um, the local libraries in town actually are giving away eclipse glasses, which I thought was pretty cool. So we got eclipse glasses. Nice. We have yeah. pretty good insurance here, so I'm just gonna look at the sun and fix it later. Yeah. <laughs> Come work at Goliath. You can destroy your eyes, and we'll pay for it. Uh, <laughs> we'll pay for the for fixing it afterwards. No, we won't pay for you to. Just, well, I guess if you're salaried, I don't know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but we did talk about today at. Uh, uh, Sorry, I just got a message coming. We did talk to, to today at engineering uh, planning about that looking at the sun during the eclipse is no worse than looking at the sun anytime. It's just that you don't usually look at the sun. That doesn't usually seem like a good idea, but it does seem like I, I had brought up that um, uh, MKBHD was like making this video or proposing making this video about. Uh, putting smartphone cam pointing smartphone cameras at the eclipse and seeing if it like fries their sensor. And I was like, Oh, why, why does that work? I, I don't think it is going to work. Right. That was our kind of our conclusion is like, do they, if you point them at the sun, does it do anything? You know? So, uh, it does seem like there, uh, might be some misinformation swirling about, uh, <laughs> about some of it. Yeah. I think the other part of it is, um, I think that some of the, and I'm speculating mostly at this point, but I think some of the like radiation that hurts your eyes um, may be less attenuated than like visual light. So mm-hmm. normally when you look at the sun, maybe you would squint more because it's very, very bright, but it won't be very bright, uh, oh. uh, you know, during the eclipse, like, like UV I was, radiation. I was also curious about this. So I looked it up like yesterday and there's a whole like NASA page about it, but okay. basically it says, it's never okay to look at the sun yeah. and you should not do that. It's never okay to look at the sun, even with sunglasses on and that the eclipse glasses are many times more filtering than regular sunglasses. And yeah, I'm pretty sure you can damage your camera sensor by pointing it straight at the sun without filtering. Um, 
I no, have a no more for the eclipse than than for just normally pointing at the sun, right? Yeah, I don't think that like the eclipse causes some bending of light to like right. straight into your iris or something like that. I think it's just looking yeah. at sun equals bad. And when the whole purpose of your activity is to look at an eclipse, then you're there's more risk. But I have a um, Voya actually, Antonis, who did the badge, oh, yeah. badge design for Supercon, he. Um, he took photographs of the international space station transiting the sun. And I was talking about it and he said he took him several tries to get reasonable photographs for, because of the contract, you know, how, how bright the sun is and getting a contrast. And then also like being lined up and taking the, fr it passes so quickly relative to you being on the ground, that, like getting the, uh, yeah. Um, so that's shot the as it goes across. Does it transit the sun often? Because yeah, when you said it, he it took him several tries. I'm like, well, how how many tries do you get? Like, how often does it go in front of the sun? I I I assume pretty frequently because it's just orbiting so many times a day. The chances are eventually it's going to go between you and the sun. Yeah. There's a there's a um, IoT project like hobby project out there that will alert you when the space station's going overhead. That's it's cool. called, I think it's called like ISS overhead. So I bet there's some other thing that can tell you when it's going to be between you and the sun. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that makes sense. But yeah, I saw the pictures is cool. Cause you know, it's this dim orange ball with all black around it. And then you can see like three distinct silhouettes of this tiny, tiny space station. Cause he superimposed, you know, shots on top of each other from, from taking them. Very cool stuff. Yeah, dude, space was wild. Just put a, <laughs> like a metal Coke can up there and sealed it with some air and some people inside. <laughs> Veritasium just did a, that's a YouTube channel that I really like to watch. They just did like um, him going out and asking like college students, like how many stars do you think are in our galaxy? And like how many galaxies? And it's like 10 billion stars in our galaxy and 10 billion galaxies in our universe. And those are both, uh, conservative estimates. Wow. But we're, but we're special. <laughs> you, you, Sam. <laughs> Snowflake. <laughs> well, are either one of y'all going to watch any basketball this weekend? Is that of interest? Yes? Okay. Well, I'm going to miss it tomorrow because I'm playing those Harry Potter shows, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But I'll definitely watch the final on Monday. Well, what about tonight? The women's. There's Oh, the women's. Yeah. You know, we watched that on Friday of last week. It was a fantastic Which game. Which one did you watch? I can't, sorry, I've watched so much basketball now. I can't yeah. remember. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Caitlin Clark is playing uh, Paige Beckers tonight. So our, I was playing UConn. I don't know if y'all, I oh, assume UConn. Mike, you've seen Caitlin Clark play. Yeah, of course. Iowa. Yeah, I was okay. like unstoppable at this point. How is UConn? She I don't even know. Uh, UConn, they were a three C. I mean, like they're historically yeah. like incredible, you know. Um, yeah. In fact, I read a stat today that I believe that maybe I guess twenty twenty two was the first year they hadn't made. This may be incorrect, so <laughs> I went to, <laughs> but I think it's I think it's true. Uh, on a podcast, incorrect. Right, it couldn't be. Everything is factual <laughs> on podcast. Um, the uh, the twenty twenty two season was the first time that they had not made the final four since 2007, which is truly absurd. I, it's very believable because they're insane, but it's, it is also absurd, but I think everyone at this point is kind of wanting Caitlin Clark to win a championship before she leaves. Cause she, and now she's, she's going to the WNBA after this year. But Sam, if you, you may not be super into basketball, I'm surmising from your expression during this conversation, but if you were going to watch a basketball game at, I think, 930 Eastern tonight, Caitlin Clark is like the most electric college basketball player I've ever seen. <laughs> it is it is unreal. So would recommend. I will think about it. <laughs> That's a no. Uh, but <laughs> I would like to. I'll be at rehearsal for said Harry Potter thing. Oh, yes. right. Well, what time does that? End? Oh, well, you're in Central, so. Yeah. yeah, it's it's uh, eight thirty till or eight o'clock till ten thirty Eastern. Okay, so I'll yeah, have to go miss most of the game. Yeah, oh, that's a bummer. Well, I will write a detailed report for both of you, and 
put it up as a PR in our architecture repo. So, uh, <laughs> oh, it's, I've been so bad at looking at PRs the last like two weeks anyway. So. You're like, that's not the way to get it in front of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Awesome. Well, uh, I think we're, uh, we're pretty close to time here. Uh, it looks like we, we had some uh, pretty good comments here. I hope we got to everybody. Um, but, uh, thank you all for I think joining. Sol, Sol was Go asking ahead. about the Bluetooth, uh, security. And we talked about that at the beginning of the episode. So you'll be able to watch oh, this okay. recording once we're done. Mm -hmm. Um, go take a look. Cool. Uh -oh. I guess we didn't talk about where private keys are stored and that sort of thing. We didn't go into that much detail, but may maybe on a, uh, maybe on a future stream. Yeah. I don't know if this is, um, yeah, these are all really good questions, I would say. These are definitely the things that you should be thinking about. Um, and I don't know if this is like in reference to like Stemo or or some of the stuff that we were talking about a little bit later. Um, I think but, it was uh, after the demo, judging by the timestamps here. Yeah. I will say, so the question is like, how do gateways verify Bluetooth devices? I think it's also, how do Bluetooth devices verify Gateways. <laughs> it's also, I'd say, maybe even more important. Another kind of attack you have to be wary of um, is not. So I mentioned like uh, denial of service. We just sit on the connection. But in the scheme I was talking about, where the gateway is just reading data off the device and sending it up to the cloud, um, especially if that is going to support an offline scenario where you may not be able to get an acknowledgement from the cloud right away. Um, another attack there is a device basically just draining your data from the device and then discarding it. Mm -hmm. um, so it gets deleted off the device and then it makes it to the cloud, um, which, you know, it would obviously be like application dependent on like, why would that be dangerous for you, right? But it's like a common technique um, that attackers use to cover their tracks, right? So you can imagine if it's like a motion sensor or a security camera, right? It could be advantageous to somebody to uh, prevent that information from reaching you. But in the scheme that you were talking about where there is a Goliath specification for the packet that encompasses the payload, that would all be encrypted with the key that the Goliath servers already know about, whether that's a certificate or a PSK, PSK ID. Correct. Yeah. Or yeah. So there may need a way. Yeah. At some point needs to know about it. I, I would like to also um continue to support Goliath like zero touch provisioning for for public key cryptography um and how you do that without sending a you know couple kilobyte uh certificate on every bluetooth transaction is uh, a challenge that we'll have to solve i have ideas we don't have to get into them um but uh but yeah generally right it's so, like at, at some point the the cloud will need some kind of information about the device whether it's a, a shared key or a public key or something along those lines yeah i feel like uh i i won't pull out excalibur but uh, i do feel like <laughs> that uh like the layers of um of security from like the you know bluetooth layer up through the application uh protocol that you're running on top of it um or application, you know, format for whatever package you're sending over it uh, would be like pretty interesting to kind of like break down the different mechanisms there. Cause we've talked about both like attacks that are targeting more like just connecting and disconnecting from or pairing and, and unpairing from like different devices, as well as like things that are more at the application level, which is where, you know, we're kind of operating more at it, uh, with like the specification that you're talking about. So seems like it could be a, a blog post. I'll put another one on your backlog, Sam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, and I think it's like, you know, something that, some things that we deal with at Goliath a lot is, right, like what's the difference between like a demo and a product? And I think one of the big differences is like security. Uh, and security can often take like a much, much more <laughs> effort than just like getting the thing working. Right. I will say, okay, so this is, uh, we, we will end soon but uh the uh so last week i was writing i wrote in the maybe maybe it was two weeks ago about like production ready demos and one of the things that i think is kind of neat about goliath is that like in uh anytime you have you know internet of things devices or you have uh a hardware that's running software 
that is not in a data center where you have literal physical control over you know its its environment uh then you're introducing like a ton of different uh attack vectors and one of the things i've thought about is like both how we do uh demos and hackathons and things internally but also how goliath enables you to do demos and things like that on top of it because like a lot of this that we're talking about right so right now we don't have you know bluetooth as a first class offering um but let's take you know uh you have a cellular device and you know you're you're sending data over it like the fact that goliath just kind of takes care of like ensuring that you have a secure connection uh and does device management and all that uh really kind of like takes away a lot of things that you actually can have a secure demo or at least you can have a demo that has a path to production a lot faster than you could without it so this has been this is me i am one of those bluetooth beacons injecting an advertisement into this stream now um, but you should use goliath because of that because there are a lot of security concerns and we help mitigate many of them are you saying that goliath can help you connect your device to go from uh, concept to product 10 times faster <laughs> sam that is what i'm saying <laughs> You heard me. Why do I right? sign up? Yeah, right. You can just mail. You you can actually just put your credit card in the mail, send it to my home address, and we'll make sure you're signed up. Real quick. <laughs> Three easy payments. Right. Uh, anywho, uh, it has been great uh, chatting with you all. Thank you both for taking time out of your afternoon. Um, I hope that you all have fun Harry Potter and Eclipse feel filled weekends. Uh, and also find it in your heart to watch a little women's basketball. I hope you have a great weekend too. And I hope it's more basketball than work. <laughs> but, yeah, I I will make no promises, but you know, <laughs> it'll be hazy. Uh, the thing is I have to, I have to get started on this talk for Embedded Open Source Summit because it is, I, I may have put myself in a little bit of a hole, but anyway, uh, it's going to be a good weekend. I'll see y'all in Slack. I'll see everyone else next week on our Friday afternoon stream. Have a good weekend. Bye, folks.